Okay, you guys, so Philippians chapter 2. Now, did you know that hate and love, okay, love and hate are tightly linked in the human psyche? Tightly linked. So there was a scientific study conducted at the University College London that concluded this. Listen to this little, this little quote I took down. Neural circuits of our brain responsible for love and hate are intimately linked. Although love and hate appear to be polar opposites, the circuits both originate from the area of the subcortex, which become activated when we feel contempt and disgust towards someone or are activated when we feel love toward someone. No wonder it's so hard sometimes to love people. We say we want to love them, but for whatever reason, we start to hate them. And you're like, God, it's not my fault. You created me that way. It's like my brain and the little circuits and stuff. Lord, they got crossed. But you know what God says, Raj, that is not an excuse, son. He says to his people, uh, I don't care where they originate from, love better always prevail, huh? That's what God says. God tells his people that love must always win. God says that when it comes to God's people with God's people, you know what must originate and what must Flourish godly relationships. And a godly relationship is based on not hate, but that other four-letter word, love. Now, in this morning's message, we get to Philippians chapter 2. And this is where Paul basically takes up that topic of godly relationships in the church and really that they're founded on the love of God. Now that's not new. I mean, if you look at those verses, that theme is not really basically Genesis to Revelation. I mean, it's all about you and I. Listen, people in Christ, I'm talking to you. People, Christians, my brothers and sisters, the bottom line that our God wants of us is what he, we would call a godly relationship. A godly relationship. I guess part of the importance there is how do you define what godly relationship means? Is it just a, hey, good to see you? Is that it? Is that a godly relationship? Probably not. A godly relationship is about love. It's about intimacy. It's about connection. The Bible, God calls the church the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is made up of what? Individual members. And all the members come together, <laughs> intimacy, all the, all the members come together under the uh, heading, under the direction of Jesus Christ, and they, and they, and they function, and they, they flourish, and they are fruitful. But if there isn't that godly love as the foundation, uh, it's not going to happen. Then we might as well just be some membership organization where people just go do their thing. But that's not what the Lord wants. He says that you have an obligation, you, and I'm pointing to any one of you, including myself, you are responsible for it. Don't even wait for somebody to have to form a relationship with you before you will form a relationship with them. This is one of the greatest dangers in the church where Christians bring the human, the fleshly psychology in and say, I'm just going to wait for people to love me. I've had people many times over the years, many, well, when I say many, not way many like hundreds, but many is in roughly 10. But for me, that's many. <laughs> who either write me a letter, send me a note, make a phone call, or sit down at my desk and say something like this. The reason I am not coming to your church 
is because of how you guys treated me. The reason I am not going to make Calvary Chapel of Prescott my, my home church is because when I walked in, nobody shook my hand. The reason why we're church shopping and the reason why we're not buying at your church is because we felt like we were ignored. And I have heard that in its various forms. Okay, 10, no, that's shortchanging. A lot more than 10, actually. But I've had some very serious conversations with people. And often it's, it's not nice. It's, it's a, it's a one-way conversation. And what I try to say in response, of course, is look, it's our, it's our heart's desire to love everybody and to do it like Jesus would. But I always put the challenge back, just like I would to myself. So what did you do? So what did you do? Did you walk in and did you say hi to somebody? So what did you do? Did you go over to the coffee cart and as somebody else was pouring their coffee, did you say, hi, my name is? Did you decide to approach a pastor and say, listen, I just wanted to let you know that we're here for the first time and, and for these particular conversations that I'm remembering, uh, most people <laughs> left in a huff. Christians, we, we can't go there. And we can't be that. In Paul's perspective, God's point of view is that the strength of the church, is that the power of the church, the influence of the church, part of its foundation is the intimacy of its people. We all have a relation, uh, responsibility to lead to that relationship. This is where I think Philippians in chapter 2, particularly verses 1 through 4, take us. Okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll pray. We'll get into the text. And let's let the Lord, you know, kind of inspire us and encourage us, exhort us, convict us, drive us, use us, lead us in ways where at the foundation of what we do, of how we do it, there's a relationship involved. That's what we'll do. Let's pray, and then we'll check out the verses this morning. Lord, thank you so much for an opportunity again to be together as the body of Christ. Lord, thank you for bringing visitors here this morning. We thank you that there are those here in our midst. We pray, Lord, for blessings just for all of us because, God, this is all about you. Lord, this is, this is for you. This is of you. Uh, we are humbled that you have drawn us here together. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word, God, and, and Lord, then to, to act upon your word by the power of God, that we may act upon it. Lord, that we may fulfill um, what your call is for our lives, what your will is for our lives, that we may bring glory and honor to our Savior and Lord Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So please, Philippians chapter 2, follow with me. I'm going to read the first four verses, okay? It says this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You can hear it right there, huh? It's, it's all there, packed in the Holy Spirit through Paul. Now, I want you to know something in the original Greek, okay? Not in English, four verses. In the original Greek, this is one long, complex sentence. It's all attached. No periods, nothing else. It just goes and goes and goes. It's, it's, a, it's a complex phrase. Technically speaking, it's what's called a conditional clause. What does that mean, conditional? If, then. It's an if-then statement. If, verses 1 and 2, then, verses 3 and 4. If 1 and 2 are true, 
then three and four need to be true. Okay, so that's going to sort of give you a hint as to how I'm going to go in this study. Now, here's what we're going to do is we're going to look at the thens first. We're going to look at three and four before we look at one and two to really, to really get this. My, my favorite outline, maybe you've studied outlines or something on Philippians 2. This would be one that I'm following that I would encourage you to follow as well. Looking at the basics of godly relationships, verses 3 and 4, and then the basis for godly relationships, verses 1 and 2. And I'm sorry I didn't put that on your notes. I should have. Okay, so verses three and four would be called the basics of godly relationships. Verses one and two would be called the basis for godly relationships. Now, verses three and four, I said, right? Okay, so that consists of two don'ts and two do's. I know I'm breaking this down for you, but don't worry, we'll explain it all. So now that breaks down into two do's and two don'ts. We'll go don'ts first. We're, we're doing everything in reverse today, okay? Don'ts first. The don'ts, now this is your first note, by the way. The don'ts, as far as godly relationships go, don't be selfish. Don't please be prideful. What does he say there? He says, selfish ambition, don't. Do nothing from selfish ambition, and don't be prideful, which is the word conceit. Don't be selfish. Don't be prideful in order to obtain and maintain a godly relationship. You know what those are? Those are the very reasons for Satan's downfall. Those are the very reasons why Lucifer got kicked out of heaven. It, it says in Isaiah chapter 14, well, you hear his heart. In Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, I will ascend to the heavens. This is Lucifer talking. I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the most high. It was all about, well, self-ambition. It was all about pride and conceit, making myself like God. And God says, I will not tolerate that attitude. It's not really what he said. Because there is no one like God but God. He says, if that's how you'll be, and that's what you say, I shall cast you out. And, of course, Lucifer, the enemy, plus one-third of the angels, forever and ever. Well, I should say never, never, to reign with God, but always to be in hell. Uh, I heard a pastor who said this. You are, <laughs> this one definitely gets you. You are never more like the devil when you display those two negative characteristics. It's kind, of, it's kind of true. Of course, then he turns it and he goes, you are never more like Jesus when you display the next two. And we're going to get into the next two, okay? The do's. But he says in the don'ts, boy, you know who you're going to look like? Don't go there. The first two, they're going to ruin your relationships. Don't go there. The second two, they're going to they're gonna remedy your relationships. In fact, I, I want you please to make a note of that, okay, as we're going along in this. Remember, Christian, we always seek to remedy relationships. Of course, the first one being what? Our relationship with God in heaven. But we are always those who seek to remedy relationships, not ruin relationships. That's how it is with, with Christians. This is our heart's desire, remedy, not ruin. You can, you can be verse 3, oh my, you're going to ruin. But then you go on from there and absolutely, God will use you to, to remedy. Okay, so first was selfish ambition. Selfishness. And everyone knows what that is. We all get it. Um, we all understand what self-centeredness, self-ambition is. If you have children, you know what selfishness is. If you have grandchildren, you don't believe selfishness exists. 
but most of us understand that to be truth. Human beings, we get it because we understand that we are where there's self-centeredness built into us. There is self-gratification, self-magnification, self-elation. Um, I just read, did you see this article from, from earlier this week that said that um, traditional vacation spots are losing business every year, particularly to the millennial generation. That's 18 to 34. It says the spots gaining business are exotic locations where the people can take the best selfies and post them. Isn't that something? Traditional spots going down. New spots going up because they're the best picture of me. 23, oh, I saw this too. 23 million selfies posted online every day. 23 million, uh-huh. Another, another little fact, Newsweek uh, magazine asked, if, uh, asked Americans, if you could have your wildest dream come true, what would it be? And 38% of them said to win the lottery. 1% said world peace. I think we all get that, though. We all understood that just now. Selfishness. But God says, God says, don't. Let nothing be done out of selfish ambition. And yet selfishness is at the center of our fallen nature, isn't it? It's at the center. It's at the center of the root of every sin. You can call it the root of every sin. Self-ambition. The devil wanted it his way, not God's way. Self-ambition. Boy, then you had Adam who wanted it his way, not God's way. Eve, of course. Her will, her way above God's way. And every time we put our way or our will above God's way and God's will, God says, no. God says, that is the very sin that I tell you not to go after. Self, ambition. And yes, it's hard, brothers and sisters, fellow people. It's hard because we are born with that nature. We are born completely self-centered. It's true. We don't, we're not born God-centered. We're not born others-centered, are we? No, we're born with giant mirrors all around us. We're born thinking about us. But God says very specifically, and, and, and you can tell I'm really driving this point because it is one of the most difficult things for us to get over ourselves. It is... It is sometimes impossible, or at least we make it uh, impossible. And verse 3 says this, just know, just know that if you pursue that, you are a ruiner, not a remedier. You ruin, you don't remedy. And in God's family, it's always about the remedy. Okay, so that's the first don't. Don't be selfish. Okay, what about the second one? I said there were two don'ts. The next one is pride or what the text here, most texts would say conceit. The newer versions say conceit. Conceit in modern translations. But if you have, I wonder, does anybody have a King James? So I want to see, does anybody have a King James that you use? Okay, about four or five of you. All right, cool. I, you can tell I go through like eight different versions during my studies at home. And then I put four or five up on the screen. I do that intentionally for you. <laughs> anyway, King James version says this, do nothing out of strife or vain glory. Do nothing out of strife or vain glory. Now, vain glory is, to me, that's the best translation. Uh, uh, kinos is the first to, to vain glory. It means empty. Uh, it means fake. Kinos, vain. And then the second part of that is doxa. Maybe you've heard that doxa, the glory, the glory. It means glory. You put those together, and it means empty glory. It means fake glory, vain glory. And I think that just gives you the visual right there. It's just empty. We might try to fake it, but it's just, it's just empty. People, people have great thoughts of themselves, and even if they don't in the moment, they'll act like they do. It's kind of all about, all about me. 
Paul says, be careful. In Romans chapter 12, he goes, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment. Think with sober judgment. Be real. Uh, one, guy, one guy said this, there are two ways to enter a room. Way number one is to come in a room with the attitude that says, here I am. And the other way is to enter a room with the attitude, ah, there you are. And the first one is always about vanity, conceit, or pride. That's a don't. How did Paul, by the way, how did Paul enter the room? You know what he did with the Philippians? In verse 1, let's say the letter was the room, okay? Uh, was Paul entering the room. In Philippians 1, verse 1, he goes, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And the implication, and actually further on, it's basically bluntly stated, if I am a servant of Christ, I am a servant of yours. He walks into the room basically through a letter and he goes, ah, there you are. And this Christian is how people need to see you and how they need to see me. There, look, he, he's looking at me. She's looking at me. She has a desire to know about me. And it draws people in a way that only God's power and God's love can draw. So he says, don't go that way, go this way. So no conceit, no pride. What else? Well, those are the two don'ts. What about the two do's? What about the two do's in the basics of godly relationships? Well, that's where verse 3 comes in. Um, and it goes like this. He goes, but instead... Okay, but instead, the do's in godly relationships, number one, is being humble or humility. You can write that down, please, as number one, humble. And I already gave you the second one because I thought, I don't want you guys to be writing too much. But, um, but the first one is, is humility. But in humility. Again, some of your versions might start like this. But in lowliness of mind which again, I, I love that translation. Except one that I found that I didn't like. You know what I heard? I, I mean, I read through one, one version. In, instead of saying, but in humility or with lowliness of mind, it said, with low thoughts of yourself. And I thought that might be a little misleading. I think a better translation is this, that humility isn't having low thoughts of yourself, it's having no thoughts of yourself. It's not about being low on yourself. It's not saying, I'm going to think bad, badly about myself, or I'm going to think weak things about myself, or poorly about myself. Humility really is just to not think about myself. It's to have no thoughts. Paul goes, that's the foundation of unity. Humility. Be humble as a part of your character. Why? Whose character really, really reigned as far as the model of humility goes? Christ. Of course, Jesus. Listen, the fastest way to making God come against you is pride. To to puff ourselves up with pride turns God away from us. That's what the Bible says. The, the other side is this. The fastest way to having God on your side is humility. And I want to give you verses for that, okay? Two verses. I, I, I put them together because they're the same quote. James chapter 4 and verse 6 and 1 Peter 5 verse 5. It says simply this, God opposes the proud. Opposes makes a good word study, but God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we dare to get proud in our lives, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, bust me. Lord, you know, I don't want to draw myself away from you, draw you away from me. Please, Lord, I want you. So in this case, thank you for revealing that I am being prideful. Break me of it. And may I turn simply to the humility of Jesus. This has got to be our prayer. Listen, Proverbs 3.34 says, To be humble 
uh, I'm sorry, to the humble, God gives favor. Okay, that's Proverbs 3.34. To the humble, God gives favor. Pray for humility, and God says in return, he will grant you favor. Whatever that means for your life, humility is a key part of it. You know humility? It's such a Christ thing. I'll tell you something about humility. So back in 2,000 years ago, okay, back in this day, back in Christ's day, you know, you had the Roman influence and you had the Greek influence. Okay, Greeks, they were, they were pretty powerful. Back in those days, you had the Greeks who were also pretty arrogant. You hear about their, what they would call their intellectual prowess. And they would basically call everybody who was not a Greek, <laughs> you know what they'd call them? Humble. That's what they would call anybody who's not a, a Greek. But you know what? It was a derogatory term. When they called you lowly of mind, that means that you were, you didn't have it all, that you were foolish, that you were anything but smart. And the servants of all, you know, the lowliest of servants, they called those guys the most humble minded. So not only do they have no respect for non-Greeks, but if you're one of the servants, you know what bad name they called you? Humble. <laughs> you are so humble. Oh, how could you say that to me? But that's what they would say. And then, and then, this is what's so interesting. What the, what the culture was considering to be so terrible a characteristic, the Bible, God comes along and says, no, this is the best of characteristics. To the point that God says, I want you to be that as a way of life. I want you to be humble. Why? Because Jesus was the model of that. Jesus was humble, huh, to the core. Jesus was lowly-minded. Humility in Christianity, you guys, God flipped the world upside down. Humble is no bad word. Humble, humility, it's something to be coveted. In a, in a very, very uh, gl God-glorifying way. Covet humility. How do you do that? Lord, would you give me? And God will give you. He will have favor upon you. Lord, I want this to be founded in humility. Would you pour all the more humility upon me? And God will give you favor. And he will multiply the humility that comes from your heart. You guys, you struggle, and so do I, with certain people. They just put you down. They're just condescending. They just think they're all that and they make you feel like you're one of the slaves in the dirt. Don't they? Or you've had experience with those very people. Listen to what the Lord says. Verse five, now I know this is for next week, but look, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was the form of God, he was the greatest of the great did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know what you do in that moment? You realize that you are dead to yourself. It's, it's you know the whole I'm rubber, you're glue. Anything you say, you know, bounces off of me and sticks to you. Kind of in a spiritual sense, you guys, that's what humility is. So what? So they degrade or demean you or condescend you. So what? Because what does God think? God thinks you are his precious jewel. He loves you so much and thinks you are so valuable that he said this, hey, my beloved son, go die for her. Go die for him. So I know what it's like to be uh, taking the left and the right, taking the upper, uppercut. But so what? You're empowered by a God who is greater than all of those things, okay? You are to demonstrate what? The love of Christ back. You are to demonstrate the humility of Christ back. So number one, do. For godly relationships in particular, you guys, how the church connects one with another, humility must reign. Number two. Number two, I said, was being thoughtful. Remember? So first was being humble. The second one was being thoughtful. You can also put the word respectful 
that's a synonym there too. Thoughtful, respectful, um, sacrificial, although that works with everything. Paul said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also, and here it is, to the interests of others. That's the key line, or those are the key words to the thought. Um, if you and I are hanging out together, and let's just say <laughs> we're putting ourselves first. We're serving ourselves first. We're talking our opinions. Don't really care about what the other opinion is. Don't want to listen, blah, blah, blah. You know what? Uh, it's not going to be the greatest little hangout time. There's probably going to be some conflict that comes up, some disagreement, some problem. You guys, that's just a fact. And what God says is simply this. You want to know how to change it? Um, look to their interest. Put them first. Count them as being more significant than yourself. Hey, how are you? And then you really stand there to listen. You really sit there to listen. You know, what can I do for you? Hey, what's going on in your life? And then you come alongside of them with the things in your life. Too many people go like this. What's going on in your life? Oh, that's going on with me too. Let me tell you about it. That's not what the call of a Christian is. Of course, we're going to be there, you guys, to minister to each other. And we get to share our issues. We get to share problems. We get to share opportunities, no doubt. But remember what heart you come into a conversation with. Remember, remember what's the default mode. The default mode is you are more significant than I am. Okay, that changes. That changes everything. But, but, but you know, this is where Christianity in its, in its most genuine form, rocks the world. This whole thing about holding others more significant than self, again, you guys, who's the model? Jesus Christ. It flips the world upside down to genuinely say, I think of you greater than I think of me. I will look after your needs like I look after mine. By the way, it doesn't say, don't look after your own needs. And that's what I'll do. There was a youth pastor, and he was talking about how he had gone to, um, uh, it was an Olympics uh, for people with physical disabilities. And he was watching one of the young men from the church in a race, in a 400-meter race. And Kevin was his name. And he said, Kevin, the whole way was leading the race, the 400 meters. In the final 50-meter stretch, he looked back and noticed one of the kids had fallen on the track and gotten hurt. So Kevin stopped. He looked down at the boy, then at the finish line, then at the boy, then at the finish line. Everybody in the crowd was yelling for him to go, Kevin, keep running, you got this. But he didn't. Instead, he walked back to this hurting boy as People ran past him. He grabbed this young man's hand as more people ran past him. He took his arm. He walked him down the track to the finish line in a way that Kevin himself finished last. He pushed this other young man through the finish line and then followed him in the finish of course, the crowd realized, you know, oh, God, did you see that? And everybody's crying and clapping. That's what happens. You know, I, I hope you realize, I hope you give yourself more credit than maybe you give yourself. I hope, I hope Christian, you know when you're just being Christian? You know what I mean by that? Holy Spirit, just empower me. Lord, right now, I just want to be like you. And then you just go. I don't know, you just go to the store. You do whatever. But your prayer has been, Lord, just make me like you. That's, that's my prayer, please. Empower me to be like you. I hope you give yourself credit that there is something about you that is just different. I don't know what it might be. Maybe there's, a, there's an air about you. Maybe it's the way you just address the person at the, count, at the checkout counter. Maybe it's the way you just looked at somebody and smiled. Whatever it is. But I want you, Christian, to give yourself that credit. Because God wants to use you for things like that. You don't want to be disappointed. You don't want to disappoint yourself. You don't want to discourage yourself. 
But this is what matters. He says, if you act like this, what, what were the words again? Count others more significant than yourself. If that's your heart, God is gonna, God is gonna use you to do such, such great things. The world is so not like that. You know, the uh, composer Leonard Bernstein, very famous, very talented guy. Anyway, he was once asked this, what's the hardest instrument to play? And his answer was this, the second fiddle. <laughs> the second fiddle. He goes, I can get plenty of people to play first violin, but to find someone who can support them by playing second with enthusiasm? He goes, that is a problem. That is the world. Nobody wants to be second fiddle. They want to be the first. And God says, no, no, no. I want you to accompany them. Make them sound good. And then you will all sound good. Okay, so that's Paul's point there. That's the, that's the do's there. Um, now look, I realize that this preaches well. <laughs> Every preacher can preach this sermon, trust me. Every pastor can stand up here and say, do well, be good. Don't be bad. Don't be mad. It's, it's pretty easy to preach. But what about practicing? That can be tough. Well, we already said why human nature. It's kind of built into us, that sin thing, that self thing. How do we achieve it then? Listen, here's, here's what I'm thinking. Okay, God really ministered to me in this thinking, and I want to pass it on to you. Okay, we're talking about godly relationships. That's the primary point here. Um, who do you know better than anybody else on the planet? You know you better than anybody else you know on the planet. I know me better than I know anybody else on the planet. I know you, but I don't know you like you know you. And you know me, but you don't know me like I know me. I got that out without any tongue twisting. Um, you know your weaknesses. I mean, I mean your real weaknesses. You know your real temptations. I mean your real temptations. You know where you just fell yesterday. You know the true hate that might lie in your heart. You know what it is that really bugs you versus perhaps what people might just think bugs you. You know the true failures in your life as I know the true failures in my life. I know my shortcomings like only I know my shortcomings. I know what could make me fall like only I know what could make me fall. Of course, of course the Lord too. And here's, here's the idea. The idea is when you go to look upon or think about somebody else, listen to this, think about yourself first. Now you understand the logic there? Think about yourself first, who I really am, how I really fall, what I've really done, my true weaknesses. You know what that's going to do to us? It's, it's going to bring us down here. It's going to give us the opportunity to look at anybody else and say, wow, I do value you <laughs> because if you knew me, yikes. You guys want the humble approach, that's it. It's so weird to say the humblest approach is to think about yourself first, but it's true. If you realize who you really are and who God knows you to be and yet exercises his grace upon It'll make you, it'll draw you to the godly relationship that God wants you to. You know, Paul, in Ephesians, he says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he goes, I am less than all the least. He goes, I am, I am less than the least of all the Lord's people. In 1 Corinthians 15, he goes, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. Because Paul knew what he had done. That's where he follows that by going, oh, because of what I did to God's people. He knew what he really did. You and I, we only have the history that's in 1 Corinthians and, and the rest of the New Testament. Paul had it all. And so he was able to walk into the Philippian church. And you know what he did? He said, ah, there you are. 
He couldn't have dared walk into Philippians, Philippians 1.1, and said, oh, you know what? Here I am. No, it would have had to be because Paul, in exercising humility, thought of himself first. Christian, that's how we do it. Go to, go to other people, even the ones you don't know, and just think upon yourself like that. Man, God will draw you. I, I, mean, I mean, God will draw them to you. This is, the, this is such, a, such a great strategy that I want to encourage you to it. Pray about it and see how God uses you in it, okay? Okay, so that was the basics. That was the, th those are the basics. Two do's and two don'ts. Or I think we switched them. Two don'ts and two do's. Now, the next part of it, verses one and two, I called the basis, the why. How about if we use that terminology, the why and the what? If you think of verses three and four as the what, think of, the, of verses one and two as the why. Hey, why do you do godly relationships anyway? All right. In your notes, the basis for godly relationship. First, selflessness. By the way, there are four things, and I, I decided to write them out for you again, so I don't want you guys scribbling. So I just had you write the word basis. Selflessness. We're in Christ. His love. We're family. Okay, so he's got the first word as therefore. Notice that in verse 1. Some of your Bibles say so. Some Bibles say therefore. And if you remember, every pastor might tell you, therefore, you always ask, what is it there for? Because it never starts a sentence. It always connects a thought. So what did it just connect? What just came before it? Well, it's verses 27 to 30. We looked at that last time. Selfishness is all around us, saith Paul. That's the connection idea. Selfishness is all around us. And church, the selfishness is out to destroy you. They hate your gospel. They hate your Lord. They're going to do anything they can to take you down because of it. Why? Because all they're doing is thinking about self. Oh, we are the world and we want it our way. Oh, who wants to follow a God who says, lay it all down and follow me? No, 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 no. And Paul just sort of reiterates that thought. Okay, and he does it. This is Paul. It's thick. But this is the whole idea there. And so in verse 27, one thing about verse 27 there is he goes, therefore, we'll continue to connect a previous thought. He goes, therefore, be united. One spirit, one mind, side by side with the good news of Jesus Christ. And he carries that thought on. Church, they're all about themselves. Don't be. It's awkward. It, it's, it, 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 it's, it's awkward for Christians to find themselves in a place where Christians are acting selfishly in the church and there's the fighting going on amongst the brethren when the very concept of selfishness is absolutely the concept of the enemy. When we are in a place that is ruled by God and the model of selflessness, having relationships that suffer because of self Fishness, it's, it, is, um, it makes no sense. It confuses the world and it hurts the heart of God. I put this and I fully wrote this out in your notes. Worldly relationships are based upon selfishness, but relationships in Christ are based upon selflessness. I hope that's absolutely obvious to all of us, but it's always good to look at. Therefore is therefore selflessness. Don't be like the world. And one of the ways you do that, godly relationships. So why? Don't be selfish like the world. What? Form godly relationships. What's number two? Number two, because you are in Christ. You are in Christ, it says. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, again, the if there, some of your Bibles will translate since. Since you are encouraged in Christ. 
in Christ. Uh, uh, Paul starts off the letter, what? He calls the Philippians saints in Christ because every Christian is in Christ. You are in Christ. Christ said, come to me, come unto me. Uh, he gave his life for you. That allows you to be in him. He forgave you. That allows you to be in him. Um, he, he made a home for you in heaven. Talk about being in him. And Paul goes like this in essence. He goes, you and I, the what, have godly relationships, the why, because Jesus started the godly relationship. Okay, when you are in Christ, when you are related to Jesus, the why, then that's how you relate to one another. There's a, will this make sense? There's an inness in Christ that needs to be expressed as an inness in our midst. This is basically what Paul is saying there, okay? So you are in Christ. That's the why, the what, in one another, the godly relationship. So that was number two. Let's go on. We're moving right on to number three. Number three was this. His love, his love compels us. His love compels us. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, just stop there, any comfort from love, again, since there is comfort from love. Okay, that's the way to understand the context here. If the love of Jesus, <laughs> not if, well, no, let me say it this way. If the love of Jesus has made a difference in your life, Christian, if I sat down with you one-on-one -on -one and we said, tell me about how the Lord's love has changed your life, I hope we have pages and pages of things to say. I just hope we have, I just hope we have those things. How could we not, huh? If we are experiencing the love of Jesus Christ, here's the deal. He goes, then the love will abound in us. So can we go with the why? Why the love of Christ abounds? What that love must abound. It's the love of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, what difference has the love of Jesus made in your life? Huh? What a good thing to smile over and pray about during your devotional time. Um, are you becoming more like Jesus? Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Are you becoming more giving because of him? And you can just go down a list and it's a really sweet thing to be able to pray like this, Lord, I see my weakness here, but I'm so in love with you and I know you're so in love with me. Will you strengthen me there? And the Lord will. So what? I'm sorry, the why? The love of Christ. The what? Show it through godly relationships. Okay, finally, number four. We're family. If there is any, uh, since there is encouragement in Christ, since there is comfort from his love, any part uh, participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. Now, now let me just stop there. Um, in context, Paul utilizes language that says we are unified in the, in the heart, in the way of family unification. Okay, if that made sense. So we are unified, the church, the people of the church are united just like a family, but of course we know that it's much greater because we know who our father is. We sang, or we are, you, or we are a child of God. Uh, that's why I just, I love that song. Um, so family, you know, families get attacked. Uh, churches, every church through every generation over 2,000 years ago get attacked from the outside. There's always that attacker, particularly against the church. They want to destroy the church. We know the enemy wants to destroy the church. There are those on the outside of the church who will mock the unbeliever. They will mock, they will ridicule the Christian and the Christian faith. They will laugh 
at the church and the family that is within it. That is always the case. But in, I want you to know something in, in Philippians chapter, by the way, Philippians chapter 3, Paul mentions that. That'll be a study for another day. What about the inside of the church? Remember I said how weird, how ironic it is if Christians fight one against the other? What about division inside of a church? Now I'm talking about family-wide, like family on one side and family on another. I'm not talking about just one individual against one individual. But when family have schisms, when family have divisions, you will find groups of family against groups of family. This is what I have found so often when I speak to people who say, oh, my family has broken apart. They'll name somebody who did something and they'll say his uncle and his aunt and his three cousins are with him, but his parents and his grandparents and all this are against him. It's just, that's the way family division goes. And Paul sort of emphasizes it with that in mind. You know, in chapter four, you're going to come across these two women, um, Yodia and, and Sintiki. And, and the thinking is that they are two people in the church, two women in the church, where there's a schism forming. But the reality or the realization by Paul is it's becoming a family schism. It's not just a schism between two women now. But what's happening is it's starting to get contagious. And he's actually fearful that the family, the Philippian church, might start to do this. And he goes, wait a minute. If there's already an attack against your family from the outside, how could you let an attack against the inside happen as well? Families can't be broken apart in schisms and divisions like that. You can't have one group against the other like that, he says. No. Family, especially when we're held together, how? How? God. We are held together in Christ. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all baptized from one spirit into one body. We are all filled with the same Holy Spirit. We are still driven by the will of God. We are still to obey the same word of God. So how could there be a schism and division to that effect that the family will actually break apart? And I think I have told you in the past, what have I told you between five and 10 churches a day shut down? because of division inside the church, not because of some particular sin, not because the pastor fell, but because of, uh, you guys read this, it's just, it's insanity, how they painted the sanctuary or who they decided to hire and, and craziness like that. Paul says, you can't. God says, don't. Swallow your pride. Hold the other up before you hold yourself. Consider and then go before the Lord if there's an issue. This is what we do, believers. This is how we handle problems. We go to each other in love. Now, if there's a sin, remember, if there is a blatant sin, the Bible already tells us what we're supposed to do. We go to that person. We confront them in love to seek forgiveness, to seek restoration. So let's not confuse those two things. So, so we're family, don't do it. Okay, so that was number four of the why. Hey, why? We're family. What? Get some godly relationships going. Okay, now the final little point here that I want to make to you, I couldn't skip this. He says in verse two, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You know why I, want, I can't skip this part? Because this is the epistle of joy. Remember? This is Paul. He's in jail. He might die tomorrow. He's chained to a Roman guard. People hate him. So-called friends went against him. And still Paul is able to say, ah, but I have joy. And he's all talking about the joy of the Lord. And yet look at this phrase. He goes, do you want to put the cherry on top? He goes, do, do, do you want to make this the best of the best when it comes to joy? Let me see you be this. All I want, church, is to see the relationships, oh, connections, and it's all founded on God. He goes, if you do that, that is the cherry. Man, that's the whipped cream on the pie. That's like, that's like everything, right? That's the ranch dressing on the turnip. I mean, it is, it is everything that you could possibly want. It's heavenly. He goes, complete my joy by being of the same mind. You guys see how important this is? 
I hope, I hope you can tell. I got a little extra passionate in today's study because, especially as a pastor, I have a perspective that a lot of you don't have. I know a lot of stuff that's going on, you know? And for the most part, I love it. But there is some that's breaking my heart. And if I'm talking to you, then you need to change. If you're stuck in some pride, if you're going to allow yourself to wallow in some bitterness, if you're going to let fear keep you down, if you're going to be slave to the flesh, then you're going to rob God and his church of the joy that it rightly deserves. It's a very dangerous thing. I want you to think about it bigger than yourself. Again, I'm talking to those of you who say, Raj, if you only knew me, or if you only knew my condition, my situation, don't go there. Okay, you fight the good fight. You, you, you seize upon the power of the God of heaven to lead you through your conflict. If there's somebody who you just can't stand right now, you change. You look at them through the eyes of Christ. And your heart will, there will be a transformation to compassion. There will be a change in attitude, okay? That's what you do. And for all of us, all of us, stay strong in the godliness. Stay strong in the relationships. Build it up with one another. Really, seek to it. I've told people in the past, that they come into my office, you know, I'm lonely or whatever. I said, here's your deal. Once a month, you have to form a close relationship. That's once a month, form a close relationship. That's kind of tough. Once a month. Now, whatever the number is for you, if there is a number, that's your call. But you guys, let's, let's pursue it, huh? If it can make a joyful man all the more joyful, it's got to mean something. This is what the Lord desires for his church to know. Let's pray.